Is Lady Justice really blind? Take a look at this picture. Lady Justice represents everything a good justice system should be. She represents how judges should make decisions. She wears a blindfold, signifying her impartiality, and she carries with her a sword closely tucked into her side and ready to wield her power if necessary. And she also carries the scales of justice to balance the merits of a case before her. In Ireland, above Dublin Castle, we have our own rather different take on the Lady Justice statue. Take a look. And what do you notice is different? She's taken off her blindfold for a start. She doesn't seem to be paying a huge amount of attention to her scales of justice, and rather she's looking lovingly at her sword, which she seems to be enjoying, waving about. What I'm going to tell you about is about research about how judges really judge, about factors beyond the law that can affect judicial outcomes. And just as importantly, how this research can be used to inform judges how they perform to help them make better, fairer decisions. Judges, predominantly, are experts in their field. They are smart men and women who have dedicated their lives, their professional lives, to considering and applying the law. Before I started lecturing in law and researching in this area, as a law student, I would pore over complex, intricate legal arguments in legal decisions. And after I graduated, I qualified as a lawyer, I went into the courtroom, and all of a sudden, I became immediately aware that there was so much more to it than what was in those textbooks. Judging was emotive. It was utterly human. It was tricky. In short, judging is hard. And the research out there demonstrates that. The research I'll briefly describe to you comes from the fields of political science and behavioral sciences. And some of this research has started to take a very interesting turn of late. They've started to use real practicing judges as guinea pigs in mock trial experiments to test for factors that might be influencing them in their day-to-day -day work. To briefly categorize these factors, they are factors in the courtroom, something that gets said or something that happens at trial that might impact the decisions. Then there are factors outside of the courtroom, completely unconnected with the decision to be made. And finally, cognitive error, sometimes called cognitive bias, which affects all of us when we make decisions and can affect judges as well. To the first of these then, factors at trial. And briefly to introduce a legal concept to you which many of you will be familiar with, inadmissible evidence. That is information that should not be let into a trial, it shouldn't be heard. And by law, it is inadmissible. But sometimes, of course, something lets slip. Someone says something during the trial that shouldn't be said. But the law says that judges, the decision makers, should disregard this. It shouldn't have any impact whatsoever on their decision. And what researchers have started to ask is, well, can judges actually ignore inadmissible evidence? In one of these experiments, researchers asked a group of 95 judges to rule on a hypothetical mock trial. So real judges, mock trial. And the trial concerned an alleged rape at a college party. 
And all of these judges heard exactly the same facts, except they broke the group of judges into two. And half of the judges heard additional information. Oral testimony from a witness about the rape complainant's supposed sexual history in great detail. The other group of judges did not hear this additional information. Now, most of the judges in the group that heard that oral testimony knew that this was inadmissible evidence and declared it as such. When you think about it, the rape complainant's prior sexual history has nothing to do with the facts leading up to the alleged rape. Nevertheless, the researchers demonstrated that it did have an effect. In the group of judges who did not hear this oral testimony, the conviction rate was 49%. Among the judges who knew this is inadmissible evidence and had declared it as such, the conviction rate dropped to 20%. That's a huge drop. The inadmissible evidence seemed to have an effect, even though they knew by law they were to disregard it. Factors outside of the courtroom then. And one factor that many researchers have looked at is bias or discrimination against a minority group. And so think sexism or racism, perhaps, in the courtroom. But this factor can actually work its way into decision-making in strange and unusual ways. In a recent study just published this year, researchers looked at sentencing decisions handed down against young black men in the state of Louisiana between the years 1996 and 2012. So real judges, real decisions, and the researchers looked at these decisions. The length of sentence is what we're looking at here. In Louisiana, there is an American football team, a college football team, and they're hugely popular, and they're called the Louisiana State University Tigers, and everyone loves this team. Now, what has that got to do with sentencing decisions against young black men? Well, what the researchers found was that if the Tigers, unexpectedly lost, suffered a shock defeat, that had an effect, perhaps, on sentencing outcomes. What they found was when they lost, when the Tigers lost, judges tended to hand down harsher sentences against young black men. And of course, when you think about it, the Tigers, like many college football teams, are predominantly made up of young black men. So if you're a young black guy up for sentencing next week in Louisiana, go Tigers! <laughs> Cognitive error, cognitive bias is the last of these. One example of this is related to numbers, decision-making about numbers. And when you think about it, judges have to make decisions about numbers all the time. I've already mentioned sentence lengths. Other examples include an award of compensation for someone who has suffered some wrong, or the appropriate amount of a fine against someone who has done wrong. And coming back to an experiment example again, researchers asked a group of judges to determine what they thought was an appropriate fine against a nightclub who had been engaging in noise pollution. All the judges, again, received all the same facts, except they split the group of judges into two. And in one group, the nightclub was called Club 58. In the other group, the nightclub was called Club 11,866, which, of course, is a ridiculous name for a nightclub. But what's the point? What's going on here? What the researchers found was that the award, sorry, the fine against the nightclub, Club 11,866, was on average three times the amount of the nightclub 
58. What's going on here? This is an example of what's called the anchoring effect, where you or I, or anyone, and including judges, when they have to make a decision about numbers, they are drawn towards a number put to them, even if that number is utterly irrelevant and unconnected to the decision at hand. So what we have here are different factors influencing judicial decision-making. Factors at trial, inadmissible evidence, possibly having an effect on judicial outcomes. Factors outside of the courtroom, seemingly a connection between the success or failure of a college football team and the outcome of sentencing decisions and cognitive error, an anchoring effect. When I think about judges, I think about how difficult a task they have, both in terms of the quantity of cases that they have to deal with, and also just in terms of the sheer intellectual rigor that is demanded of them. When I'm talking to my students, lecturing to them, I try to emphasize that there is so much more than what is in those textbooks. That judging is a tricky, human, messy business. And my aim, and the aim of other researchers out there, is to refine this research, to improve these experiments, to understand these effects more. And also, quite simply, to get the message out there to as many judges as possible. And a lot of really good work is being done. There are encouraging signs where judges are really starting to get on board with this research. In Slovenia and in the United States, judges are starting to participate in judicial training conferences where they participate in miniature versions of these kinds of experiments. And they become more self-aware and self-reflective on their own practice. In England and Wales, I spoke recently to the head of selection policy in the Judicial Appointments Commission, uh, where they are charged with recruiting judges. And they've started to introduce, at the recruitment stage, role-playing exercises, qualifying tests, to test candidates' independence and soundness of judgment. But this is just the start of something. So much more needs to be done. As far as I'm concerned, every judge should know about the results of these studies. Every judge should even perhaps participate in these kinds of experiments during training to help them be more self-reflective and self-aware of these kinds of effects. And at the very least, every judge should know the basics of these psychological effects at play. To my mind, that would lead to better, fairer justice. Thank you.